All right, time. so let's start with where were you born? Tell us. I was born in Syracuse, New York, and uh, my mom had me out of wedlock. With uh, she was eighteen, and my dad was forty-two. He's a mafia guy. She worked for his hotel, and uh, she was a she was a barmaid. Uh, and his illegal gambling. And so she got pregnant at 18. That was back in 1962 when it wasn't cool to have a kid outside of marriage, outside of wedlock. And so she then convinced this other guy that I was his dad or his son. And uh, so I never knew my real father until I was about, uh, I think, 35. And so I thought this guy, Billy Farrell, but I never really knew him. So I had a lot of pain in my life, didn't have a dad. My mom died uh, when I was six from alcoholism. She, uh, uh, because my dad didn't marry her, she loved him. And uh, so she was alcoholic, she choked to death. And uh, so I was really sad. I was bounced around. Um, from Syracuse, New York, to Chicago, to Oregon, to Wyoming, and I was all these places. And so I, before ninth grade, I'd never stayed in a school more than, I would always usually change schools at least twice a year, sometimes three times a year. So I had hardly any friends, but um, I had a lot of anger in me. So about fifth grade, uh, a friend of mine introduced me to marijuana in Oregon. And uh, so I started smoking marijuana uh, and I was just kind of a crazy kid. And my, cause my grandmother drank, my, my aunt drank a little, um, but everyone pretty much in my family drank. My mom definitely drank. And there was a lot of violence with my mother before she died with my grandma. So I saw that. So I just had this kind of propensity to drink. And uh, I was kind of taught without being taught that when you, when you were frustrated or hurt or angry, you drank. And so I just learned that. And I even brought that into Christianity somehow. Like God delivered me instantly from drugs, but alcohol, whenever I'd be really hurting, that would be the temptation to go to because it's so socially acceptable, which is sad because now marijuana is acceptable. Now they're trying to make almost every drug acceptable. But I thought, oh, it's acceptable. So I can go, you know, if I ever was really hurting as a Christian, a lot of times, uh, not a lot of times, but when I was really hurting, you know, every, maybe once or twice a year, I could turn to alcohol, quiet, hidden. And so, because I, thought that was just what you do and uh, now I've learned of course you turn to God because alcohol makes a bad situation worse so anyways um so I got involved with drugs I started doing drugs well by my seventh grade year I uh was starting to sell drugs um my friend's dad was a Vietnam vet and he kind of sold drugs so I started selling drugs well I because I was such a bad student I would pay people to uh, to do my homework for me and give them marijuana. And so I would give them drugs. So I kind of, besides selling it, I'd also use drugs to get, and I was pretty popular, to get people to do my homework for me. I, I finally get to, to high school, and it was so wild how, so my freshman year in high school, my name was changed, and I remember I should tell this. My name used to be Farrell, and that was the dad who really wasn't my dad. And these people used to call me, uh, so my my name was, uh, uh, they used to call me Faggy Farrell. And uh, some people did that, some eighth graders. And so I, that's too long a story to explain the whole thing <laughs> of that. If you want to get the backstory on that, I'll have to do another story. But uh, so I then became, um, by my ninth grade year, I said, I hate my name, Farrell. I want my my grandfather's name, Roters, as my mom's maiden name. So I got Roters and my freshman year, I decided that, um, no more uh, was I going to be called Faggy Farrell. So I told my friends, I'm Rotors. I and mean, people say Rotors, you know, if someone changed their name over a summer, it's kind of weird. But I said, I'm Rotors now. And anyone calls me Faggy Farrell, I'm going to punch him in the face. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to punch about 20 people in the face my freshman mm -hmm. year in high school. And I just became a bad boy overnight. I became really, really mean. I was a kind of a tough kid, but I became really hard. Like, I don't care. Even if you're my friend, I'll punch you in the face if you call me. Faggy Farrell or anything bad. And so I was just so hardened and mad because of that. Cause I went on that teasing for about a year. And then, uh, I started selling drugs somehow after the seventies, this is probably late seventies. It got to be where just say no to drugs and it was not cool to do drugs anymore. And so people would call me like, so I, I got busted my freshman year with a lot of marijuana, like a 
you know, pound of marijuana. And so the principal goes, we found the marijuana. And he's dragged me through the whole halls, showed everyone. So everyone's like, stoner, stoner. And it was like crazy. It was like, I was like, like I was totally shamed. It was like, I was tarred and feathered yeah. and which is kind of good. But I mean, it was like, it, this is important the part of the story. So I was just like shamed and, and it was just like so bad. And I felt like such a loser. I felt like just a little stoner kid. And then all of a sudden I left, I would always leave Oregon or, or, um, New York, Syracuse. Those are the two main places I started going back and forth to. So I go with the summer with my grandpa in Jackson. And I started working like the summer of my, uh, fifth grade year. So I'm going there and all of a sudden I would come, I came back my sophomore year in high school and marijuana is cool. Everyone's doing marijuana. Everyone. So all of a sudden I became from stoner kid scum to now I'm the man, rotors who can hook us up. So I started I'm like, oh, and I had this anger because all these people had teased me and said I was a loser. So I started selling them like oregano, kind of a little <laughs> mix, more of oregano than marijuana. They didn't know what it was. So they were like, oh, it was awesome making money. So I'm making all this money and I'm, I'm, I'm doing, you know, really good. And uh, so I, uh, with all that, I had, uh, you know, and I worked, so I had money through that too. But I had, uh, in the summer, I had, um, uh, I had like 20,000 in the bank. I had two cars, two motorcycles, had pretty much everything I wanted. It was pretty popular. And, uh, and, uh, all of a sudden I'm, I would get these thoughts. Me and my friend Glenn, that's the kid I said in seventh grade who, who would do my homework for me. He became pretty popular from hanging out with me and, uh, cause I was fairly popular. So I'm, I'm sitting there and now we're going to flash fast forward to my freshman year in high school. And uh, it's about Christmas time. And this guy, Dan, I'm in Corvallis, Oregon now. And this guy, Dan Hicks, who was a two-time national champion wrestler. That means he's the best wrestler in the whole United States. And uh, if I remember it right, he, the guy he beat in nationals took the Olympics. So he would have been like Olympic gold medalist, but his knee blew out. So anyways, so this is the guy who... Sh- who uh, um, we know everyone kind of knows him because the town's only 50,000 people and everyone knows Dan Hicks is kind of being this stud and he was just kind of a name. So anyways, I'm sitting there during wrestling. This guy comes up to me and he says, Hey, what's your name? And I go, Craig. And I was kind of cocky and tough. So nobody just came up to me. People do not to come up to me. And, uh, and so this guy says, Hey, uh, do you know what that crucifix what that cross on your neck means? Uh, about God. I didn't even know to say Jesus. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, so he explained to me the gospel and told me what Jesus did for me. And I'm just like, this is amazing. You know, I didn't, I wasn't trying to act cool, but inside I'm going, wow, I had no idea. And so, um, so then he said, he invited me to church and I found out this kind of neat. It's kind of funny just to show the grace of God. Like where I said, what you're saying the grace of God, I was, he was a young life leader at Corvallis high school also and my friend, a good friend, Greg McGowan, said that uh, they asked, Dan said, who's the worst kid in your school? Who's a kid that you believe God couldn't touch? There's no way. This kid's just wicked. He's evil. He's going to hell. He doesn't care. And I even used to listen to ACDC, Highway to Hell. I used to sing it and love that song. And, and he goes, Craig Roters. And he had always shared Christ with me. I knew him since fifth grade in Oregon, on and off, you know, because I'd go back and forth from New York to Corrales, and he would share the Lord with me, tell me about God, I'd go, Greg, you're too good a guy. I really, but I really liked him, even though I didn't, I was like, think he's too naive to know that I'm too far gone. And so anyways, he says, Dan, it's Craig Roters, pray. And everyone said, yeah, Craig Roters. So everyone started praying for me. So before Dan met me, they were praying for me. And so he would come up to me, we're praying, pa- parents would go, we're praying for you. And I'm like, do I have cancer? What's going on? Why would you pray for me? I'm doing great. I yeah. I'm thinking my life is awesome. Right? I'm a little lonely, a little sad because if my aunt didn't really love me like I wish she would, or my grandma was drinking, but I felt good outwardly because I had everything I could want in this world. And so then Dan shared gospel with me. He invited me to church. I went to church. Oh, I got to tell you this. So all of a sudden after wrestling practice, my friend said, how do you know Dan Hicks, the two time national champion wrestler? I didn't even know it was Dan Hicks. I just saw some dude just bold talking to me. So it was Dan Hicks, the two-time national champion. We're wrestlers. I go, <laughs> oh, yeah, Dan's my good friend. I've taught him a lot of what he knows. We've been friends. You know, I was a lying <laughs> scammer. So I just acted like, oh, yeah, we're friends forever. And so Dan invited me to church that Sunday. I went, and he said, would you like to receive Christ? Well, I'm like, 
uh, can I, I'm like, I don't know, dad. I mean, I'm a pretty bad guy because I was Catholic. I believed I had to get good then accept God. I couldn't um, just come as I was and say, God, I'm a wreck. Please help me. But I still didn't believe I was a wreck right then. So anyways, so, but I accepted Jesus because I like the savior part, which I think 80% of America loves yeah. the savior part. Yeah. But I was honest, I really concerned about the Lordship part, which I'll get into a little later. So I'm sitting there and I, I go, yeah, sure. But I mostly accepted, and here's a saying people say, people fall in love with you a lot of times before they fall in love with Jesus. They fall in love with Jesus in you, but it's really you they fall in love with. I fell in love with Dan, and not anything weird, but mm -hmm. I fell in love with the two-time national champion, this guy who was like a, kind of like a father yeah. figure. He was so tough, but yet he cared about me. And, and here he is, is kind of the notoriety of a two-time national champion. So I really was like, I mean, I, if, he, if he had told me he's a Christian, he was Joe Blow, I probably would have said, get out of here. Oh. But because he was Dan Hicks, I was like, and I always say that, you always tease Dan Hicks, two-time national champion, because that really did draw me in to going, I want it. So he prayed the prayer. So as a good Catholic boy, not really understanding the gospel, I thought, okay, now I got to be good in my own strength. Mm -hmm. So I tried as a drug dealer, as a womanizer, uh, you know, I thought I'm not going to um, do drugs and I'm not going to drink and I'm not going to have sex. I'm just going to not do it. So I did that starting Sunday afternoon, praying with him after church. I did that for a week. By the end of the week, I was exhausted and I went to a party, but I wasn't going to drink. And my friends, they had all come from Christian homes and had fallen away. So they're telling me, you can drink, you just can't get drunk, and you can drink light beer. And I'm like, really? And I know nothing about the Bible, and so I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, you just can't get drunk and drink light beer. And I'm like, I never drank light beer, so I'm thinking maybe you can't get drunk on light beer. So I drank, and I just found out light beer tasted terrible, and you can eventually get drunk. It takes you a lot more. But So I, I got drunk, and then I just, by the end of the weekend, I'm back to the old Craig, and I told Dan on Monday morning, or Monday afternoon, I should say, at wrestling practice. I said, Dan, and this is probably around Christmas time, I said, of my first senior year, I said, Dan, you're too good of a guy. I can't lie to you. So I had integrity. It's weird. I had integrity, even though I was a scamming drug dealer. Yeah. I still had enough integrity that I didn't want to lie to Dan and play a scam. So I encourage you, if you're a Christian or you're kind of new at it, don't scam and lie to yourself because you're really only hurting yourself, right? Yeah. So I just said, Dan, you're too good of a guy. I can't lie to you. And I knew a lot of his youth group kids, they buy drugs from me and they were scammers. So I'm like, I'm not going to do that to you, Dan. I can't, I'm not going to pretend to be a Christian if I'm not a Christian. And so I said, Dan, here's what I figured out. And I was a scammer. So I said, you told me all I have to do is say, Jesus, come in a, into my life and be my personal savior. Amen. So I said, Dan, here it is. If I'm doing a lot of cocaine and I feel like my heart's going to pound onto my chest, I'll just say, Jesus, come in my heart, be personal savior. Amen. And he'll save me, right? But Dan looked me in the eye, this tough wrestler, and said, I'm going to pray that God breaks you and shows you that you need him more than anything else in the whole world. And I immediately, I mean, I was so angry. And I was demonized. I didn't know it then, but I was demon, And I had the spirit of anger. And I just, if it was anyone else, I would have punched him in the face. But I was, I was, I always say I was crazy, but I wasn't stupid. I knew not to punch. This guy could pin me with just his legs. And I went, okay. I, I just, I, but I got mad and I said, Dan, how can you call yourself a Christian and you want God to break me? Are you kidding me? And then all of a sudden, the first time I ever heard God's voice, God spoke to my heart. I just heard it in my head, like kind of my conscience. I heard, Craig, if I'm real, don't you want to know me? And if I'm not, nothing's going to happen. Yep. So I went, it was kind of like God called me out as a tough guy. I went, okay, pray the prayer. So Dan prayed the prayer. I'm thinking God's going to, all of a sudden, I'm going to have the wrath of God. Well, right out of high school, so this is about Christmas break, my senior year. So then right out of there, I got a job right out of high school making about 34000 a year. So I'm going, this is God breaking me, then yeah. break me all day. And then right after that, cocaine. I started getting involved with a lot of college people with cocaine. I started selling cocaine, making money through the roof. So I'm going, if this is break brokenness, then, wow, I'm not really, this is awesome. And so, and Dan, when Dan said, God, to break me, he said, just let me give you this Bible and just keep this. And when you're ready to surrender to God, then, then, then just here's a Bible. And, uh, and, and I, my two biggest fears were I couldn't surrender to God completely because I didn't want to give up women and I didn't want to give up fighting because I believed if I gave, you know, women, I just didn't want to give up because I 
like being immoral, but two, I didn't want to give up fighting because I was afraid that here I'd beat up a lot of people. I didn't want people to line up, you know, it says turn the other cheek. And Dan taught me that, well, you, you don't have to let people light up to beat you up. You just have to not beat them up back. You just have to restrain them. And I go, so I can, I don't have to let them kill me. And he goes, no. And I'm like, okay. You know, so that <laughs> kind of answered that one, but I still wasn't ready to give up the drug dealing because there's so much money and the immorality. So I was like, yeah. So Dan gave his Bible. I'm now fast forward to um, end of my freshman year, uh, or end of my senior year, egg, the week of graduation. I didn't graduate high school. Um, I cheated and I got caught and they took away my diploma. So anyway, I, uh, I'm, I'm doing seismograph, making lots of money, flying in helicopters, but I'm with all these ex-Vietnam vets that are all druggies, and now I'm a drug dealer, so I am making so much money with these guys, I'm not even cashing my checks. The guys are like, Rotors, you haven't cashed your checks for two months, what's going on? I'm like, oh yeah, checks, you know. I was making, I just didn't need any money. So, and but right about this time, this is probably the end of July, I'd worked there two months, and I'm, we're, we're doing explosives, I'm high, everyone's, it's a French crew, it's called CGG, they're, the, the head guy's, smoking marijuana. I'm sitting there, everyone would be asleep. We'd get up at like, we'd start work at six in the morning and I'd be up like three in the morning walking around and, and everyone would be in their tents. We were out in the middle of nowhere in the woods and, and uh, I would just hear the Lord saying, pray, read your Bible, pray. And I'd be like, mm, no, thanks. Uh, you know, hey, and I'm good. And then, uh, and I had my Bible with me, kind of like good luck, but I just kept it tucked in my, you know, my suitcase. And uh, all of a sudden, we go to a bar in uh, in Afton, Wyoming. Afton, Afton, I think, yeah, Afton. And Afton, Wyoming, I, we've been there. They've yeah. seen the jail where I was at. So I'm sitting there, and we're at this bar, and I'm dealing cocaine right at the table, and and I'm just cocky. It's a Mormon town, and uh, the more it was so Mormon town, I forget how big it was, not very big, but it had one Baptist church, as one. Now it has no Baptist church. The church that I had is gone now that I saw. But so I'm there. And uh, all of a sudden, um, uh, we, we got in a big fight. And it was the, the juggies. That's what we are, seismograph, the juggies, the hippies. were kind of hippie guys. The, a lot of them were Vietnam vets. But then there's the roughnecks. And those were, a lot of them were Vietnam vets. But they were more the conservative. They worked for Exxon Oil. They were like the roughnecks. And so we were getting fights. And we had beat each other up. And, you know, and I was a pretty good fighter, so I did all right. But our one friend, our one friend got knocked out unconscious. And he was under, so we left the bar, but we forgot we didn't have him. And all of a sudden, we're driving out back to the campground to go fly out the next day. And all of a sudden, we're going, where's our friend? And and uh, we go back into town about 3 in the morning because bars, I think, closed at 2. And uh, we go back, and all of a sudden, and we had a bunch of cocaine, a bunch of uh you know, uh, pink hearts, bunch of speed, all this marijuana, just tons. We just got in a bunch of stuff and me and this other guy in his big van and he's got a van where like a uh, girl's got a big thing of Coke and she's like, you know, so it's just obvious we're probably druggies. So all of a sudden these cops, woo, they light us up and we're pretty drunk. And so, uh, oh, and I beat up this cowboy that this roughneck and I don't know if you guys remember the little roach the little clips with the beads and the feathers they used to put on cowboy hats so I took that I always take something as a souvenir and I put that on his rear view mirror so all of a sudden the cops pull us over I'm just ready to take a bunch of uh, speed and I just drop it on his shag rug so it kind of blends in the rug and all of a sudden the cops I look there's a cop right next to me I'm looking at him and the cop so I don't know how he didn't see it but uh, so they bust us well, the first thing the cop says, up oh, paraphernalia law, he looks at that roach clip because he thought it was a roach clip for, for marijuana joint. And so I'm like, I'm just laughing like, that's not a roach clip. A roach clip's back here. No, okay. But I'm like, going, that's not, I said, that's not, you know, I'm going, what are you talking about, dude? That's from some dude's hat that I beat. And the guy goes, and I'm laughing. I go, I'll get you out, man. I'll pay your fine. Because they would trump up charges because they knew we were roughnecks. They knew we had a lot of, uh, I mean, juggies. They knew we had a lot of money. And rather than, fight it you just pay it because you, you knew you were a drug addict so you could have been charged but i was kind of cocky so i'm like no i won't try so the guy goes the other guy right next to me says cop says why are you laughing you're in reaching distance you're getting arrested too and i'm like what well i gotta kind of go back a little bit i was selling cocaine in this town and all of a sudden these police realize there's a big surge of cocaine so they're like what's going on well they had 
arrest this one guy. The guy I saw, this guy had big gashes in his face, beat up. They said the police beat him up with handcuffs wrapped around their hands, were pounding him to get him to say who it was who sold him the drugs. So all of a sudden, the police, so remember that story. So then the police uh, take us around the van, frisk us, and then they put the handcuffs on my friend, and then they're getting ready to put the handcuffs on me. They put their lace my hands behind my back, and they put the one cuff on, and they bang it. The one cop banged it against the, the van, so it pinched my skin. You can see the scar right here. You can't see it, but you can see a little scar right there. And so I'm like, going, oh, you sure that's on tight enough? And all of a sudden, he's getting ready to put the other one on, and I remember that guy who got his face bashed in by the police officer. So I just go, whoa. So I spun around, hit the guy, not meaning to, hit the police officer in the face with a loose cuff. So I have one cuff on. Boom. Then that is like all of a sudden there's six policemen and they've got one guy's got a gun on me and I'm kind of coked up. So I'm crazy. And I'm like going, come on, Barney Fife, shoot me. Come on. And he's like, and he's shaking. And I'm just because I'm too dumb to think I can die. And then all of a sudden. I realize nightsticks win. This big sheriff guy behind me takes a nightstick, and hits me in the lower back as hard as he could. My friend said, swung it all the way out. And I just like, I remember it was just like getting the wind knocked out of me. I'm sitting there uh, uh, and I fell down, went in the jail car. They put me with this, they put me in the cell with this guy who's crazy. Anyways, I'm looking at striking an officer, trafficking. I don't remember. Uh, they trumped up so many charges. Then uh, drug per I'm looking at nine years of prison. I just turned 18. I'm, I'm, this is like August 1, maybe August something. And uh, so I'm like, I'll be good. I'll be good. And it's like the guy's like, Oh, but you've reached the big time. What are you talking? This is a be good. You're 18 years old. You, you know, you you've got a you already got a. I had a lot of juvenile stuff, you know. And he goes, "We see your rap sheet. You're a bad dude. You know, you're trouble." And uh, and so I'm like, and you, I'm thinking federal prison. I'm I can't go to federal prison. I got to. I'm thinking like suicide by cop. I got to figure out. So I can't go. I'm just not gonna go to prison. And uh, but anyway, so I'm in. I was in jail for three days. And uh, finally, they let me out. I had to pay, I don't know, a pretty big fine to get out on my own recognizance. But I, um, I uh, got out, and uh, I get a good lawyer. This lawyer fights it. There's, they're saying it's illegal. There's no such thing as paraphernalia law. So I was, because he said resisting arrest. He said, what are your charges? They said resisting arrest. He goes, resisting arrest for what? They had sold my drugs. So, the, so I had to spend a lot of money to get out of jail. I spent tons of money. Um, I think I spent like 15000 I mean, I spent a lot of money. Well, this guy, I almost said his name, but this lawyer says, we're going to sue. We can win because they struck you. They had no right to arrest you. It was, they trumped up charges. So I'm all excited, uh, you know, that I'm going to make money. Well, this is, this is like August 1. Dan had prayed God to break me. December, so it was about six months later, a little more than six months. So then, because my goal was to be a millionaire, by the time I was uh, 21, I realized, and now I'm 18, I realized I'm probably not going to be a millionaire. I, I, I mean, I always had this thing where I would do drugs, but I could always stop because you don't do your own stash. You don't, you don't do your own stuff because it eats your profits. Well, now it's just starting to, I was so depressed. I was starting to do my own. I was just selling kind of to do. So I was eating a lot of my profits because I was just so depressed. And uh, finally, I get back to Oregon. Uh, we're doing the, the thing this when you sue the state of a state it takes like he said three to four years so it was gonna be a long time before I ever saw the money if we won but uh, so I'm depressed so I started doing a lot of LSD well Oregon has the highest suicide rate because it's okay. so rainy that's why I love Tucson people mm -hmm. from Oregon always go how can you handle all this sunshine I'm like how can you handle nine months of total gray and darkness. But anyways, so I would just, it really affected me, the weather. So I started doing a lot of, I was doing a lot of cocaine, a lot of marijuana, but I also started what really, I believe, opened me up to the demonic is where we get the word pharmakia, which means source, sorcery. The word sorcery in the New Testament is pharmakia, and that's where we get the word pharmacy, drugs. So I never got into witchcraft. I never did like Ouija board. I never did light as a feather, any weirdness like that. I, and if I did the Ouija board, I think I did a few times, but I joke, I go, ooh, you know, I make it move, but mm -hmm. I was doing it just to mess with people. So I never saw anything like where it was, you know, I was superstitious as a Catholic, but I didn't really see anything that goes demonic. I always thought I was making it up. So I never, I kind of laughed at it, you know, but I started doing LSD a lot. And this is probably around November December of uh, of 81. This is at the end of 81. 
And uh, I just started getting so depressed. Well, me and my friend Glenn, that's the guy who I cheated with in seventh grade. Well, he's a friend of mine now. Or he's one of my best friends. We would start talking about committing suicide together. We would talk about, it was weird. Like there was a lot of kids that would do suicide packs where they would all like sit in a car and put the, a tube from the exhaust in the car, get high and do drugs. It was like a big thing in Oregon. And so it was kind of cool, you know, like the old, uh, there's an old song by, uh, it doesn't matter, but there's a song that says, don't fear the reaper. We can be like them, Romeo and Julia, like don't fear death. And because I believed in reincarnation, I was taught that by my new age aunt, I didn't fear death. So I wasn't afraid of hell or anything. I thought that was just for s stupid people to believe. And so yet I still kind of believe in God in a weird way. So I'm sitting there and, uh, so we'd talk about taking a shotgun and he was going to shoot me. We'd go one, two, three, shoot. But I'm thinking, what if, what if, what if I shot him and he didn't shoot me? And I'm like, you know, I said, I don't know about that. So then I thought maybe we do the car thing, but then I thought that's too girly for me. I was a tough guy. So that that's too sissy. So uh, we never did it, but we talked about it a lot. Well, I, so now fast forward to right again about Christmas. So it's about a year later. Well, my other good friend, Thomas, so Glenn and Thomas, and I can't remember the name. We called him Congo. I can't remember his name, real name now. But that's why I had three main friends, and they were all druggies, and they were all ex-Christians. They were all Christians, Christian homes, but fell away. So if you don't, you know, the Bible says if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it's better to put a millstone right now. These guys totally I tried to undo what Jesus is doing, working hard to do. So it's not good to be a carnal Christian. Mm -hmm. So, or someone who knows Jesus but doesn't live for him. So anyways... These, so Congo and Thomas came to my house and they go, Hey, Rotors, we got a lot of LSD. We got this Phoenix. It was like called Phoenix and it's really good LSD. And I don't know what bad LSD is, but it's really good LSD. And so I was called Radical Rotors. So I had to always outdo everyone. So they're like going, Oh, one friend said, I'm just going to take a half a hit. It's like these little things look like stamps. I take half a hit. And I go, Sissy, I'm taking four hits. So I'm like, I'm taking four tabs of acid. Most people take one. I said, I'm taking four. My friend took, I think, one. Uh, Glenn took, I think, or Glenn came and he took two. Well, all of a sudden, the, you never, you always say this is druggy. You don't want to trip alone. All of a sudden, this is God. All of a sudden, all my friends go, oh, my goodness. Here it is. Friday, I think it's, yeah, it's Friday night, December 4th. Friday night, December 4th, 1981. And all my friends go, here we're all on acid. They go, we got to go. We got to go. I got to go home. I told my mom I'd be home. I got to go pick up my grandma. She's coming. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, what? It's like, and I don't know, it was like probably 11 o'clock at night on Friday night. I'm like, what? And so they all left me. So I'm all by myself, stormy, rainy, gloomy night, typical Oregon night in December. And all of a sudden I'm all alone. And then I hear these voices. I'm sitting on a lazy boy and I'm on my, and I hear these voices, kill yourself. Kill yourself. Nobody cares. Kill yourself. Come on, do it. And and uh, you know when when people would fight. I don't know if you ever saw this at Push Rich or they fight as much. But people would say, "Come on, don't be a wimp. Fight. Do it. Just do it." Well, that's what these demons are saying. Don't be a pussy cat without the cat part of it. Don't be a wuss. Don't be a wimp. You just you kill yourself. Don't write a note. Just kill yourself. And I'm like, uh. And I was a tough guy, so I went, "Okay, I'll do it." And I'm just sitting there and I was thinking two ways. I was either going to kill myself by taking my motorcycle and running into this wall right in my school. Cause I kind of wanted to do something dramatic. I think that was just the devil through me trying to do something, but I was going to run my motorcycle hundred miles an hour right into this wall or I was going to shoot myself. So I said, well, it's rainy. I don't want to get wet. You know, you have weird things and I don't mind kill myself, but I don't want to get wet. It's too rainy. So I said, I put the gun and I put the gun in my house and ready to shoot myself. And all of a sudden I hear the Lord second time. Lord says, Craig, where are you going? And I hear these voices. So all these voices being like, kill yourself, kill yourself. And just like, just screaming, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. And all of a sudden the, I hear this calm voice say, Craig, where are you going? And immediately voices went like that. And all of a sudden I, I went, oh my goodness, I can go from hell on earth to hell. And I dropped the gun and then like God, and usually when you're on LSD, you don't go, you don't pass out. You don't like it. So all of a sudden I just like, I knocked out. So I figure I kind of, my friends left about 1130. Um, I probably passed out between 12 or maybe 1230. I don't know about 12, let's say. And, uh, I wake up the next day to about two in the afternoon. So I was out for what, 14 hours. 
Yeah, 14 hours. So two in the next day, I had this old girlfriend who's named Kiersey. She was a real wild girl, nuts, crazy partier. And she had just gotten saved that week. Well, she said, Craig, did anything happen last night? I just felt like God put you on my heart. And I just feel like I was supposed to pray for you all night long. And this is why we say, people don't trust sinners. Uh, you know, some so-called Christians could lie. But I said, uh, I go, no, nothing <laughs> happened. You know, here's a God on the floor. No, 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 no. What you mean? No. And how do I say this? I got to say this. I had gotten so from, so from when I got arrested to about almost six months later, I became so scummy that I went from being very popular with girls to where no girls, everyone see me go, whoa, because I was just so gaunt. I was just doing cocaine. I wasn't eating. So I went from probably, I went from like 220, uh, pretty skinny, you know, percent body fit, about 6% to about 190, 180. I mean, people, I was gaunt. I was like dying. And people would see me and go, whoa. And girls were like, eh. You know, so I went from being real popular to just scum and to where I couldn't, get a girl to like me if I paid her and so all of a sudden when Kiersey called I'm thinking like a scammer hey this girl used to really like me and uh and I have to say this is really neat I dumped her a year earlier well about a half month or during uh the Christmas all night Christmas all night what do you call it, all night graduation party she'd made me angry and I said get out of here and I dumped her so I just dumped her right in the middle of a party and got really mad at her. And here she's calling me. So she never wanted to, I'll never talk to you again. I hate you. So for her to call me was so weird. She calls me and says this. And then she goes, Craig, I really feel God is drawing you to get saved right now. I really think something's going on. You need to give your life to Jesus. And so I'm like, she goes, come to this meeting. And I go, yeah, whatever. So I'm thinking, well, I can kind of, I mean, forgive me, but I can hook up with this girl. So I just, this is how good God is, how sovereign God is. So I'm going with totally impure motives. I'm totally a scumbag thinking just maybe I can hook up with this girl. And uh, I go um, to this meeting and uh, I, oh, and I got to say this, I'm only living for two things. I'm living for drugs and I'm living for sex. And I'm not, I'm like getting drugs and I'm not even making money. I'm just making up. So I don't have the women and I barely have drugs because I'm going to run out of money eventually because I'm just not making any money. So I'm just going, that's all I'm living for. And, oh, I got to preface with this. So this is a Friday, or this is now Saturday afternoon. She invites me to this meeting Saturday night. So that Friday before I did the LSD, this girl Renee, and this is very important, this girl Renee uh, called me up and says, Craig, Craig, I really heard you're not doing well. I really like to come and see you after school. And she's a, she's now a senior. I've graduated, right? Or I've, I'm out of, uh, you know, I'm a year out or half a year out. And she says, I really want to see you. So I'm thinking, ooh, Renee. So now I'm living for two things, drugs and the possibility of Renee. But I'm also thinking Kiersey. So Kiersey, and this is important, Kiersey takes me to this meeting. It's at Oregon State University. And it's a big amphitheater. You know, remember the big amphitheaters where it holds like 400 people? It's one of the biggest ones. And this guy's speaking. And this guy is, his name was Greg Ball. And this guy was a, a he fought Chuck Norris. And so again, a fighter, God knew I needed. So he's a fighter. He had fought Chuck Norris. He's a karate, but he was a kickboxing champion and he uh, was a Christian. So he's talking and he goes and he pans the audience and he says, if Satan has you by, and he mentions all these things, drugs, money, greed, da, 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 you name it, any sin. He says, and if he has you by sexual immorality by women, he says, say no way, Renee. And I'm like, oh. Uh, and he looked right, he panned the whole audience. He looked right at me and said, say no way. So I'm like a tough guy. So I'm like, I would always stare people down. I'd never look away. And all of a sudden he looks at me and I go, and I couldn't look. And I'm like, and I'm thinking, maintain. That's the thing druggies say, maintain, maintain. That was just coincidence. He didn't really say it. That's just something he says. It's not, he's saying Renee, because that's all I'm thinking about this girl, Renee and Kiersey, but Renee, Renee, Renee. And, and I went, Wow. And I just, and I put my face down and Kiersey goes, Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. And I go, why? And she goes, cause he was staring right at you. And I go, he was, he, he really, like I was trying to say, I'm not crazy. He was, like, she goes, I'm sorry. So then I'm like, maintain coincidence. I'm sitting there and then he talks and he talks about how 
you know, kickboxing champions, how Chuck Norris, he said, I fought him. But all these guys, and he said himself, they're tough guys, but they're really not that tough because they're really, they got tough because of deep insecurity. They said, Chuck Norris, you know, is from Globe, Arizona, right down the road here. And he said he had a lisp. And if you look at it, the early movies, you can see that he talked like this. And so he'd say, hey, come on, guys. And so what happened is people teased him. And so Chuck Norris became tough to combat that. But really, it was out of deep insecurity. Do you see that? And so he's saying this, and I'm like, shut up, because that was me. Because I pictured myself, my view of myself deep down was me sucking my thumb as a little kid scared with a blanket. And he tells me that, and I'm agreeing with it, but I'm mad. Like, you don't say that. You don't give the goods and say we're all a bunch of afraid. So I was really kind of like, I knew it was true, but I was mad that he was saying he was giving up the secrets of tough guys. And then all of a sudden, he goes again. He goes, if Satan has you... By, he says, by sex, by greed, by, by, um, by money, by, you know, materialism, whatever, whatever. He says, and if Satan has you by, um, by drugs, and he's pointing to the law, and he says, say no way. Say no, because Jesus wants you. And he pointed again right at me. And again, I'm like fighting it. And all of a sudden, I go like this, and I couldn't look. And Kirsten goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I go, did he just stare right at me and say, say no to drugs? Like you need to give up. So I'm like, oh, okay. So then he, he then I maintain, I stand back up. I mean, I sit back up and I just go coincidence, coincidence. And then he gives an altar call. And like out of 400 people, probably half went down, maybe more went rushing down to accept Jesus. And I'm just sitting there. And all I hear in my head is you're too far gone. You're, you you can't give up drugs. You can't give up women and you need to kill yourself. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's what I need to do. I need to kill myself. And then this guy, Greg Ball comes walking up the steps and I'm like halfway up. He was walking up, leaves the altar call. And he says, son, he goes, I've never felt this in all my life. Been doing this for like six years that God wants you right now. You need to give your life to him. It's a matter of life and death. And I'm like, huh? and you think most people would be flattered, you know, the guy came up to, I was like, mm. I was like, okay, yeah, all right, that's great, thank you, all right, you may go now, you know, I was trying to be polite, but I was like, I was just, I don't know how to explain, I was just terrified, and sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I go, okay, let's go, and as soon as I said, let's leave the amphitheater, also this other guy, I don't remember his name now, golly, but he was my rival drug dealer in a town of 50,000, it's not a huge town, and he goes, uh, it's McClanahan was his name, something McClanahan. But he goes, he goes, Rotors, Rotors, are you a Christian? Rotors, oh my goodness, dude, it's real, it's real, man. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a Twilight Zone. What is going on? And he's saying, he, he looks at me and he goes, You're not a Christian, are you? And I'm like, Uh, yeah, shut up. You know, and he's like, He goes, Rotors, it's real. He goes, I just accepted Christ last night. I flushed $1,500 worth of cocaine down the toilet. It's real, Rotors. Seriously, dude. It's real. And he kind of figured out, I think, you know, so you can't scab a scab. You got to do, you're here for curiosity, aren't you? You're here just to scab. And I'm like, shut up. You know, I'm just like, be cool, man. And I think, you know, and he was brand newly saved. So he knew to not bug me too hard or I'd get really bad. And we used to fight a lot too. Anyways, so they go, let's, you got to go out to dinner. Let's take you out to dinner. So we went to this place, which I took you, I think I took somewhere to, uh, a, what was it called? Um, Togo's the sandwich shop. And it used to be amazing. Now it's been bought out by corporate. It's worthless. It's like, it's like, it's like subway. It's terrible. But anyways, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it was awesome. I mean, it was like, so, was, so they took me there and I always love their, to eat their steak, uh, cheese steak sandwich. Whew, yeah, I'm drooling just thinking of it. But anyways, mm-hmm. so we go there and they just go, they don't know Jesus. They, they're baby Christians. I just go, accept Jesus. Come on, come on, Rotor. Accept Jesus. Come on, accept Jesus. Come on. So, I mean, and there is God bless zeal because I'm going to tell you in a second, it did work, even though my heart wasn't totally into it, but they pushed me. And sometimes we are so PC as Christians. We're like, oh, I don't want to offend anyone. Mm-hmm. Okay. But don't you think people are going to be offended if you loved them all the way to hell? I bet you're going to be offended for all eternity against you. So wouldn't it be better to risk offense now and get them saved where they thank you like Veli with me, right? I mean, Veli goes, you offended me, but thank you. I mean, uh-huh. that is such a blessing. But yeah. do you think about if I said, Veli, you do whatever you want. And then she went to hell. And she's like, Rotors, Morgan, Ryan, nobody told me. I can't, you know, so I would rather offend now with a chance of someone repenting than worrying about it. Anyway, that's free too. So um, they say, pray the prayer. So just to get away from them, just to get away from them, this is the mercy of God. This is how good God is. So they go, pray the prayer. 
They didn't even know how to pray the prayer. I mean, they just, I said, okay, whatever. Just so I get out of here. So I said, they said, Jesus, come in my heart, be a personal savior, whatever. And I said, okay, man. And I prayed the prayer, repeated it. And I didn't feel anything. And I wasn't into it. I was just, just to get them off me. Yeah. But truly, I, you know, it was, I was scamming again. Because I was too far gone. I believed the lie. So then I go back to my friends. Well, my apartment was like the hangout place and I had good stereo system and I had HBO and that was the only premium channel back then, but I had HBO. That was back when you only had 50 channels, you know, mm-hmm. they used to, you know, or I think we had 27 channels, but I had HBO. So everyone loved my place. And so I would never give my friends cocaine, but I'd let them have my mar- basic marijuana because I had a lot of marijuana so they could always get high. So I come in to my my apartment and my three friends are there, Thomas, Congo, Glenn. And, uh, and so I, uh, I, I go in there and there's like this cloud of marijuana smoke that was just normal everyday life and a bunch of beer. And they go, rotors, rotors, did you hook up? You know? And I'm like, and, and I'm just like, and I'm, and I'm, and as soon as I hear that and they go, they have a bong and they go, here you go, rotors to tell about the story of tell about my conquest or tell about whatever my scamming. And I just go, I, I give, I go, I don't want to get high. And I'm like, who are you? What have you done with Greg Rotors? I mean, I was like, I was like, it was like, I was outside myself. I was like, I don't want to get high. What are you talking? And I, I got to preface with this. I'd always, me and Glenn had tried so hard to quit mar- just marijuana and we couldn't marijuana. So forget anything else. I mean, so we just would try to quit drugs and I couldn't quit. I had to get, if I didn't get high on marijuana, this is a good shout out for people who think marijuana is good. I felt high if I wasn't high. And they also, I just heard from uh, this guy, Christian guy saying, marijuana, continuous marijuana sm- smoking makes your brain smaller. Yeah. So, hey, <laughs> so whenever, whenever I go, what was I saying? That's because I'm not good. But so it was, so the, the, I just go, what is going on? I don't want to get high. What is, and I'm inside this, having this eternal dialogue, internal dialogue going, what is going on? And my friends are going, what? And they're like, oh, Rhoda, you're such a joker. Thinking I'm just mess with them. Cause I would joke a lot. I still joke a lot, but I go, I don't want to get high. And I was kind of like freaking me myself out. You know what I mean? Like that, kind of like that movie. What's that movie? I'm angry. I'm really, it was like, enchanted. Kind of really, yeah, enchanted. I'm, kind of like, I'm like, I don't want to get high. I don't want to get high. I, I can't, I don't want to get high. And my friends all of a sudden they go, Oh, Rotors, don't tell us about this blankety blank Christian stuff. I, I didn't say anything. I just said, I don't want to get high. They go, don't, Oh, don't tell me you're a born again Christian. Oh my goodness. And cause they knew I was with them. They were like, Oh my goodness. Ah. And they go, they go, so they go, that's it. And they, they drove in the car, took, oh, one guy said, my dad was a blank and blank F and blank and Christian, or they were Catholic. And he says, my dad would act all holy on Sunday, beat us, beat the tar out of us all week long. And yeah, that's what Christians are. Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, and I'm like, uh, dude, don't you think there's some sincere Christians? Because I think Dan's a sincere Christian. I think Greg's a sincere Christian. They knew who these guys are. I go, don't you think there's some? I, mean, I know there's a lot of hypocrites because I sold a lot of drugs to so-called Christians. But I went, don't you think? And they're, no, they're not. And so then they take me over this guy. And this, like I tell you, it's a long story. Sorry. You guys are really chiming in, aren't you? But uh, you want to say something? <laughs> no. Oh, man, going. this is long. Okay. No, just, <laughs> But, uh, so, but this is all true. It's all God. So it's good. Yeah. But anyway, so, so I go over to the, so they, they, they took me over to these people, their, their dad and mom had died, I think in a car wreck. I don't remember what, but they're, but they had this grass farm and it was grass, like, like grass, like on your lawn grass. And so they converted it to a marijuana, basically a <laughs> marijuana ranch farm. And they did this hydroponic things and they wrote it. So they were like really smart, nerdy kids, but they, so they were my dealers they were like the guys or the guys that sold marijuana that's why i had so much because they had so we would like take whole things of marijuana and put it in the fireplace and make the whole house full of marijuana so i mean just they had marijuana to burn literally and but they had really good stuff too that was really so i'd always try to break in and they had pit bulls because they knew about it. so i would try to steal it but uh, they, they had this red hill sesame and and so they would never let me touch it they'd only sell it for like outrageous prices and uh they, it was pretty much for them and for just maybe special occasions it was like their don Perignon of marijuana and so i so all of a sudden they go Rotors, they, so then they go, guess what? Rotors are Christian now. So now there's five against one because these are two brothers and they're going, oh really? And they had the same thing. My dad was a Christian. He was a Catholic and he beat us. And so they go, that's it. We're getting you high out of your mind. 
So all of a sudden they take they take this red hair sesame and clip it off, put it in the microwave, put it in a in a big Indian, this maybe where it got demons, but an Indian peace pipe had a long peace pipe, just packed it full, and they go all the way around and I'm saying, I don't wanna get high. I don't get high. I don't get high. And they're going passing all around. And we're listening, I need to say this, we're listening to this hardcore rock station. It's called Kagon from uh, Portland, and it makes our 96.1 look like mellow. It's hardcore rock, hardcore. Every song was ACDC. Every song was hard. It wasn't any mellow stuff. It was really hardcore. So we're listening to that, listen to that, and all of a sudden, um, the pe- the peace pipe goes around, and, and my hand's like, well, you don't want to get high, but I do. And it's like, again, I felt like I was outside myself, and I think I was demonized. I didn't know that then. But this, I grab the pipe, and I get high, and I'm just like, and I just go, I failed Jesus. Now this is the second time. As soon as I go home, I just felt like this voice said, see, you can't accept Jesus. You got to go home and kill yourself right now. As soon as you get out of here, kill yourself. And my friend Thomas, who's rededicated, rededicated his life, said when he saw me, he saw like death come upon me. Like literally, he was like, they're all excited, like get Craig high and get him out of this Christian thing. And he said he literally got scared like, knew he'd caused me to stumble. Like I probably just sent this guy to his grave. Cause I literally just like, I just, I couldn't believe I failed so bad. And so I'm literally going, I'm going to go home. I'm doing it. No more questions. Blowing my head off. Done. And, um, I, uh, I sit there and I'm just like, just depressed. And I'm just like, this is about three in the morning now. And, uh, all of a sudden I hear on the radio, it's the hardcore rock station. Jesus Christ is real, man. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's real. I've had sex. I've had drugs. I've had alcohol. I've had fame. And it's nothing. Jesus is the way, man. And I'm like, God, is someone messing with me? Are you kidding me, guys? You're this. I hear I'm ready to kill myself. You're messing with me. And all of a sudden, and they're like, what is this junk? Get it off. And I'm like, don't touch. And I was kind of a tough guy still. Even though I was kidding. I go, touch that dial. I'll kill you. you know? And I'm like, what? And it was Joe English. You don't even hear about this guy. You guys don't even know who he is. He was the drummer for Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney and Wings, the ex-Beatle, the, one of the founders of the Beatles. You know, ever heard of Paul McCartney? I mean, even you guys know that. And he, it's his drummer when he did, he then broke off and did Paul McCartney and Wings. So he's saying, I had everything. Jesus is real. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing this, I'm like, and I'm listening, it was a rock block, you know, they used to have these things where they'd have like little testimonials, and it's him doing a rock block, uh, you know, sharing his testimony, and thinking, what is this? I mean, think about God, the sovereignty of God, of him letting, have a rock block on this hardcore station, I think just for me, you know, it's like, they're like, Uh and I'm like going, you see, because they knew who he was, you see, you can be a Christian and, and still be cool. And all of a sudden, I'm like going, ah, and I got up. I, I felt like all of a sudden, I, the high left me. I ran home, and I was so oh, bad of shape, and I'd smoked so much marijuana. I'm like, like ah, ah, you know, going, I mean, green stuff's coming out of me. And I ran home. And this is where it really gets cool. And this is what I say always at church. But I, I, the same chair, I almost killed myself the night before. And now it's probably like four in the morning. I kneel down and I kneel down on it and I say, Jesus, I've ruined my life. I've destroyed my life. I hate my life. But if you can do something with it, it's yours. I give you my life. That was my simple prayer. That's all I did. No one was with me. I was all by myself. And I prayed that. And I I couldn't sleep. I was so excited. You know, Jesus. And And I took out my Bible and I'm like, I can't read. read. I can't read. And I'm just like, I go, and I remember Dan saying, read the Gospel of John. So I started reading the Gospel of John. That's what we're going to teach the Gospel of John. I'm reading the Gospel of John. And I just like, and I can't read hardly. And I don't, it's, and it's New American Standard, the old New American. So it's really hard to read because literal translation. And I'm like, uh, I don't understand. I felt like the Ethiopian Mm -hmm. eunuch. I don't know what this means. And, uh, but I knew I knew Jesus. I Mm -hmm. could feel it. I mean, I truly, and that's what I want to say here besides just give my testimony. This is why I'm such a big proponent, Morgan. And, and, and Mariah, your name's Mariah, right? <laughs> I, I, is, is, it's, it's when I made him Lord. Come on. I had made him Savior before, a year before, with Dan. I love Savior. But it wasn't really, really give up drugs, give up self-rule, give up women. But when I finally came to the end of myself, when Dan's prayer was answered, show him, Lord, you need him more than anything else in the world. When I said, okay, God, it's yours. No bartering. No, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, it's just... You're not getting a good deal here, God, but whatever I have is yours. That's where I saw the Romans, where it says his spirit 
bears witness our spirit that we're a child of God. I knew, and I knew, and I knew I was saved. I knew it. I knew it. And I was just, I was changed. And there, I mean, not that I didn't have issues, but I was, I mean, radically changed and instantly delivered from drugs, instantly delivered from alcohol. I still, like I said, struggle once in a while, but I, that was my phone, but I, <laughs> I, I struggled once in a while, but I mean, it pretty much, I used to drink a case a night of beer. So, I mean, I quit overnight. Well, so excited. I go to church and uh, I, I, I go to church Sunday morning, right? It's Saturday night, but Sunday morning. And, uh, and I go to church and I have long hair about to build my back. I look like a druggie. Everyone knows my reputation. And I go to church and I'm sitting in the front row. So picture this druggie, he drugged out skinny like a Keith type. I'll get rid of that one Keith mm-hmm. guy. Just crazy, you know, but I loved you. I'm just like this. And all of a sudden, two elders sat right next to me. And this is neat. When you really know Jesus, you don't get offended easily. Because I just looked at him and I laughed because I knew I'd be afraid if I saw me coming to church. I knew, like, I understood. I was like, hey, dude, what's the deal, man? Don't judge me. I was like, I judge, but trust me, I, I get it, you know? And I'm just laughing, and I'm just, amen, and amen, and and and, uh, and so, and then Greg saw me, and Greg's, like, talking to me, so I'm talking to my friend Greg, and share with me forever, and I'm telling him what happened. And then, this is really cool, this is where, so, you know, as a druggie, you're like, hey, man, be cool, don't be a narc, dude, don't, don't tattle, you know, don't narc, and... I see all these Christians that I dealt drugs to and they're like, what are you doing here, Rotors? What are you doing here? Mm-hmm. And I go, I know what I'm doing here. What are you doing here? I said, you have one week, and Dan was our youth pastor, I said, you have one week to get right with God or I'm telling on you. Either you tell Dan what's been going on or I'll tell Dan, but you ain't gonna do it. So basically half, a lot of those kids left and the rest of them repented and turned. So it's really cool. Because when your drug dealer gets saved, you got you got to get right. right? Yeah. You know God's either real or he's you know you're freaked out. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. Yeah. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram to check out our behind the scenes at Calvary Conversations. Also, thank you so much to our sponsor, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please make sure to check out their website in the description below. Also, if you would like to support Calvary Conversations with a one-time gift or a monthly gift, you guys can do that in the description below by clicking on the link that says support. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Take it easy.